I'll see what I can do to help wrap this up in a way that is stimulating and yet a little bit puzzling. So I just want to explain to you that when I was about 10 years old, we went on a class trip. I was growing up in New York City and we went on a class trip to the uh, planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium in the Museum of Natural History. And um, I was, the first time I was ever in the planetarium, the planetarium was an incredibly interesting place for me. And the, the speaker, uh, I don't know who it was, it wasn't Neil deGrasse Tyson, but um, he was a very interesting person and he explained that we have oxygen on Earth and to our knowledge this was the only body in the solar system that had molecular oxygen in the atmosphere. And I came home and I thought about this and I explained to my mother that this is the case and I could light a match and, and, and light a candle here and I can't do that on Mars. And then I thought, naively, that some adult is hiding from me how we make oxygen. So I didn't know how we make oxygen. I knew plants made oxygen, so I, I thought somebody knows how oxygen is made in a plant. It just, it just was a secret that they were going to keep from me. And I thought maybe when I was 15, this, this, this secret would be revealed. And then I was 20, and I thought the secret would be revealed. And then I realized we don't know the answer to this day. Now, um, if you think about that, that's pretty profound. So Shen is working at Okayama University. There are others that are working around the world trying to understand the natural process by which organisms have evolved to split water. We don't know. How nitrogen is fixed, we don't know. So I'm just saying this to the younger people in the audience that the fundamental processes of the catalysis of reactions that are so critical for the function of the Earth are largely unknown, let alone their evolutionary history. So just how they work today isn't very well known. So I want to talk today a little bit about the origin and the emergence of coupled biogeochemical cycles. And this is the bridge part that I look at. The origin is on the other side of the bridge in that, that little island, Manhattan obviously, and uh, we are moving out into the rest of the world. So this bridge goes to the rest of the world. This, this connects the origin to the rest of the world. And really what I focus on here, let me just go back for one second before I get there, <coughs> is the scaffolding, right? So we can build the lanes and so on, we can ferry things across, but really it's the strings across the bridge that keep it going and allow it to stay, stay suspended and stable. Um, and that's an analogy that I think is a pretty interesting one. And let's start at the beginning. So I really like this plot. This is, of course, the classical Goldschmidt plot. Victor Goldschmidt was a genius, actually. Uh, he was born in Zurich. His parents were Jewish. His father was a chemistry professor and was given a position in Oslo at uh, around 1895 or 1898. And Victor, who was born in 1888, moved to Oslo, and he actually never really wanted to ever leave Norway again. He was arrested by the Gestapo during the Second World War and actually freed by MI5 and another group of, uh, of, of Brits. He was arrested twice. Um, and he was taken to England for safety during the war. And after the war, in 1947, I guess, he returned back to Oslo. He didn't want to stay in England. Um, but he spent his life as a mineralogist and, and, and tried to understand probably one of the most profound things, which he didn't understand, of course, in the beginning, what the distribution of elements are in, in our neck of the universe. And of course, we didn't know about um, cosmochemistry, and we still don't know a lot of the issues about cosmochemistry. But this, this graph, or distribution of elements, um, is an interesting one for several reasons. First of all, sorry. First of all, <clears throat> there is the primordial uh, Big Bang element, or elements, hydrogen and helium. And these two last elements out here uranium and thorium, which with, with potassium-40 formed the radiogenic core of our planet and all the rocky planets that we know of in our solar system. But the issue is here, 
If you think about the energy sources for life or the energy sources in, uh, in the universe, we know of two. Um, sorry. One is the fusion reactions that are coming from these very light isotopes, or hydrogen primarily, giving us solar energy. And the other is radioactive decay within the rocky planet, which is giving us heat. So it's interesting that the extremes of this elemental distribution are the sources of energy. Everything else in the middle is something that is used as a building block, either for rocks or for life. Now, the second interesting issue here is obviously <clears throat> The, the RS distribution of elements, I'm not going to go through this in the cosmochemistry world, but we, we wind up with a very, very stable metal. And that's iron. So iron becomes the most abundant transition element that we find cosmically. And that's, that accident, if you will, of nature has led to a lot of chemistry that is based on, in life, on this element. Now, the elements that, of course, make up life in the polymer world is hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Um, and so those big six, the schnapps, as they're called sometimes, um, those big six elements form all the polymers of life that we know of. The lipids, the proteins, the nucleic acids, the carbohydrates. Now, within the big six, one is unique, and that's phosphorus. So phosphorus, although the fugacity is very, very, very low for which you can reduce the phosphorus, and it, it can be done, for the most part, phosphorus is an oxidized species as phosphate in nature, in rocks, and it doesn't undergo oxidation reduction reactions for any, to any great extent. The other five are in a dance, a great dance of transferring electrons to and from each other, driven by either thermal energy or solar energy. And that dance has created a global metabolic pathway which is very similar to what you will see in, in a keg plot for a cell. So the entire planet is basically a big cell, and I'll describe that in a bit. So let's for, first of all take away one. Life is electric. This is not a metaphor. This is not a metaphor. It's not, I'm not saying electric as a metaphor. It is electric. We're moving electrons around, okay? So all organisms are deriving energy for growth and maintenance by moving electrons from a substrate to a product. We've, we've witnessed this throughout the entire last two days and today. So it obviously follows that substrates and products must be cycled, which means biological processes are paired. They're half cells. You're a half cell. I'm a half cell. Okay? So <clears throat> we can talk about the triviality of it, and we've seen this in, uh, in several slides of the photosynthesis and respiration process. And uh, we can talk about photosynthesis in a number of ways. So photosynthesis can drive electrons off of some molecule. In the case of the most of us sitting here today, we're most familiar with the photosynthesis driving electrons off of water to produce molecular oxygen. And they drive electrons off and produce protons. They don't drive electrons off and produce hydrogen. We can discuss that later. But in the early Earth, and we can see this in extant metabolism of purple bacteria, for example, we can drive electrons with very simple amounts of energy off of hydrogen gas, or iron-2, or H2S, or even carbohydrate. So those were electron sources in the Archean. And today, of course, the electron source is liquid water. Um, and liquid water has a great advantage over the other substrates. 
is liquid water is readily, vastly available, so you don't have to carry your volcano with you. You don't have to worry about substrate limitation ever because it's always going to be available on the surface of the planet as long as it's just right. We don't boil the water off like we do on a neighboring planet, and we don't freeze it down. So as long as there's liquid water, we have a source of electrons. And then we come to this, which Rohair, or I, I believe, uh, referred to earlier, and that is this disequilibrium between the photosynthetic rate of oxygenic photosynthesis, which is producing molecular oxygen and, and carbohydrates, sugar, candy, this is candy, and the aerobic respiration that takes the candy and consumes it back to water and carbon dioxide, which is what we do in the room. So when we're breathing right now, two gases are coming out of our bodies, at least from our nose, and they are water and carbon dioxide. So the water is just a water-water cycle, right? That's, that's the planetary upper extreme now of, of the redox couple. So obviously these, these can't be balanced on a planetary scale over geologic time, otherwise we would not have had oxygen in the atmosphere, as Rohir said. So let's explain this a little bit more. This is the, the water as viewed by Apollo. This is an actual photograph. I, I love it. And here's another interesting problem. So if I took all that water, which is at 73% of Earth's surface, roughly, and I roll it up into a ball, that's all it is. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's a thin, 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 thin veneer. Thin. And yet it's been on the planet for at least 4.4 billion years. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now here's another thing we don't really understand. Where the water came from. We don't know exactly where the water came from. It's probably not cometary water. Robert in Paris would tell you that it's probably meteoritic, at least based on the DH hydro, uh, ratios. And then Drake would say, of course, it's the thin, wet veneer, that this is just water that has come out as, as the rocks started to cool. It begs the question, well, how did the rocks get the water? So it's just kind of a panspermian problem. Where did the water come from? All right. Now, it takes a lot of energy to split water. At SHE, it's about 1.2 electron volts. Uh, at pH 7, it's 0.82. All right. Now, Vernadsky, Vladimir Vernadsky was another character. He was a Ukrainian, born in Kiev. He was, uh, like Goldschmidt, he was an extraordinarily intelligent person. Very, I mean, Goldschmidt, I think, got his PhD at 22 or 21. PhD. Um, Vernadsky went to Moscow with his family early in his life, lived most of his life in Moscow, and <clears throat> created a field which we call biogeochemistry. He created it. He wrote a book in 1928, which was never translated into English until 1998. Um, his son, George, was a professor of history and of Russian studies at Yale University. He uh, made an asylum leap in France and came to the United States. His father remained forever in the Soviet Union and was the father of the atomic bomb in the Soviet times. Bernatsky had a perception of, of things that was an intuition of things which, for which he had no proof, but was one of the most profound insights that he had was that all organisms that are alive exchange gases with their environment. That's profound. So that means that if an organism can exchange, has to exchange, if it's alive, gases with the environment, 
it can change the gas composition of a planet. And Vernotsky realized this. And we use that subconsciously. We don't state it, but we use it subconsciously in our search for life on exoplanets. So, the gas exchanges are via redox reactions. So you're transforming a solute or a liquid to a gas phase. It's a state transition. It's not just simply gases going in and gases coming out. They're state transitions. We're taking liquid water and converting it to protons, electrons, and O2 gas. We're taking sugar and converting it to carbon dioxide. Or, in the case of a photosynthetic organism, taking a gas and converting it to a solute. In this case, for example, sugar. So the core reactions, many of them, in the metabolic processes are related to gas exchanges. Now, if we start to look at who created metabolism and where it is today, and I'm not going back to Luca. I want to take a look at extant metabolism and its origins in some ways, but let's, let's not worry about Luca for the moment. What we see is these two main clades, sorry, I'm going to go back here. Two main clades of prokaryotic organisms, the bacteria and the archaea, which have the ability to exchange genes, as we've heard, by viruses or even by free DNA um, <clears throat> across in a horizontal transfer mechanism. And so many metabolisms are scrambled. Okay? And then we come up to this curious group of organisms up here. Eukaryotes, and in, as one eukaryote talking to others in the room, frankly, eukaryotes are terribly boring from a metabolic point of view. They didn't create anything metabolically. They're just, we are just big versions of E. coli with less metabolic flexibility. All right, now, I just want to take a few seconds of historical diversion for a moment because I, I think it's interesting. In 1665, Charles II, by edict in England, established the Royal Society. And why did he establish the Royal Society? Well, he went to France. And Louis the King showed him the French Academy. And Charles went back to London, and he was not going to be outdone by the French. So he established the Royal Society. And within the Royal Society, there were many people in the Royal Society at that time. Not many, but I mean, members were not all, or the original fellows were not just scientists. So Pepys was a member, I believe, and so on. But one of them was an interesting character. It was Robert Hooke. And Robert Hooke was a poorish guy. He didn't, he didn't come from great wealth. He didn't have a university position like Newton or so on. But he, he wanted to have a microscope. And, and, and a guy named Cro uh, I think it was Croc in London, was commissioned to create a microscope for him. And it was a compound microscope of two lenses. And the spherical aberrations were pretty bad, so you couldn't really get magnification beyond around 20 to 30x without having a lot of fuzz. So it didn't work very well. But what he could see were eyes of fleas or wings of fleas. I, there were a lot of fleas that he studied. Fleas were apparently pretty abundant. Um, and other organisms. And he also cut a little, 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 little thin section of a piece of cork. And he identified these little squares within this thin section, which he called cells. And that was the very first identification of what he called, what was come down to now to be a cell. 
And the reason we call it a cell is because Hook called it a cell. And why did he call it a cell? Because it reminded him of a place in which the monks lived, in a room, a cell. It looked to him like a cell. All right. Now, in Holland, totally independently, in Delft, there was a fabric merchant named Leeuwenhoek. And Leeuwenhoek was also fascinated by what, what he couldn't see. Now, you have to think about this for a minute. <clears throat> Galileo had already had a telescope. So you can see stars. You know they're there. And you just wanted to get them to be closer to you. So you could build optics that could make things big from something you already knew existed. Now, it turned out that Galileo, if you inverted the telescope, you had a microscope. And one of his microscope makers actually made him, a telescope makers, made him a microscope, which sat on his desk. He was convicted and sent to house arrest in the Inquisition, close to his daughter, Galileo. And he never wrote anything that I know of about any microscopic observations. But we knew how to make it. Leeuwenhoek was quite wealthy, successful businessman, and he bought the finest Venetian glass that he could find, and he pulled it into a little strings, and then he would melt the string into a sphere, and he polished these little spheres, little spheres being 2 millimeters, 2.5 millimeters. He couldn't control them very well but he would polish them. And he never, ever gave away the secret, even up until his death, of how he polished these spheres. So nobody knew exactly how he made these lenses. And he would put these lenses in a very, very simple tube slab piece of metal, usually made out of copper or silver. And there's the lens. And he put a sample behind it. And he would peer through it, usually to, uh, uh, to a uh, candle, but you could also put it up to a diffuse light in the, in the sun. And he could get magnification up to 400x. Amazing. Amazing. So he started to write papers, and he sent them to Hook in London. Hook. And he never could read any English. Leeuwenhoek knew no English. So Hook had these papers translated, and then Hook became so fascinated with Leeuwenhoek that he taught himself Dutch so he could translate Leeuwenhoek's papers. And Leeuwenhoek's papers were published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And Leeuwenhoek himself was made a foreign fellow of the Royal Society. He never went to England. He never went. When Leeuwenhoek died, he had already made 500 microscopes, of which about 300 were in his collection. His sole surviving uh, offspring, Maria, his daughter, the others had all died. Maria sold the microscopes at auction for the price of the medal. Four of the microscopes were given to the Royal Society as gifts. When I was writing my book, Life's Engines, I went to the Royal Society, and I know the librarian, and I asked him if I could see Leeuwenhoek's microscopes. And he comes back with a, a box with white gloves and very gently puts it down on the desk, presents me a pair of white gloves, opens the box, takes out the microscope, and gives it to me. And I'm looking at it. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. He says... It's a reproduction. Going, why? He says, well, we were given four, and fellows through the years borrowed them, and somehow they've never returned. So there are four microscopes sitting in London, in England somewhere, hopefully, still, that are the original Leeuwenhoek microscopes. Nobody knows where they are. Now, what did Leeuwenhoek really learn? Leeuwenhoek started to describe cells and he called them animalcules. And I really like this one down here. So the animalcules were thought to be little animals. 
They had little brains, little stomachs, little livers, little sex organs. They were just little miniature versions of animals. But then he realized something which was really interesting. He got a cold, Lewinhoek did, and he started to take preparations for this cold. So he would put peppers, peppercorns in water and soak it for a couple of days and then drink it, thinking maybe this would help him. It tasted terrible. And a few weeks after he was better, he realized that there was a bottle of this peppercorn sitting on the shelf and it was cloudy. So he took this cloudy water and he put it in his microscope and with the highest magnification lenses, he could see very small things that were running around like this. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And he wrote a paper to the Royal Society for the Philosophical Transactions describing these ultra-small animacules, the first description of bacteria. Well, Hook had had enough. I mean, he'd published several of these papers, and now he's getting this total science fiction. So he sends 10 people to Delft, including a vicar. You know, everybody was a vicar at the time, but he sent a vicar to actually verify that Lewinhoek hadn't been drinking too much or wasn't making up the story. So these guys come to Delft, they look through the microscope, and they believe what Lewinhoek wrote. So Lewinhoek now has prima facie evidence and witnesses that there are these microbial organisms that you could not see even with a lens where you could see these kinds of guys. They're smaller, much smaller than this. And then he does something even more clever in a way, and I like this one. He takes an old man whose teeth are rotting, and he swabs the mouth, and he observes there's a microbial zoo in, in this guy's mouth with rotten teeth. He does the same thing to himself, and he realizes that he also has a microbial zoo, but not nearly as bad as the guy with the rotten teeth. But then he drinks a hot cup of coffee, and he does the same thing. And he realizes the microbial zoo is virtually dead from the hot coffee. So it's the first time that we start to realize that microbes could be killed by heat. And we could go on and on with spontaneous generation. I just want to talk to you for one second and make a note here. This concept of a cell created by Hooke, we still can't make one. We still don't know how they're made. It's really amazing to me. So um, I'm just pointing this out because we can talk about Luca, we can talk about a lot of things, but there are a lot of very, very simple, quote, simple problems that uh, are challenging. So I want to talk for a little bit now about what's inside the cells. I'm going to look under the hood for a second with you. And I spent most of my career trying to do this. And I focused on this machine because I've spent most of my career working on that machine. So I first started working on this part of the machine. Oops, sorry. Uh, this part of the machine, Photosystem 1, and I've spent the last 20 or so years working on this part of the machine, Photosystem 2, and this is the water-splitting business end of the machine. And I don't want to go through the whole story here. So basically, Eric, this is, this is a bifurcating system. We split the water, the protons go here, the electrons go there. We pump some more protons, the electrons go, the pump some more protons, the protons finally go up there, the electron winds up here, and then the protons and electrons meet in NADPH. So we always have this couple, proton, electron, proton, electron, proton, electron, proton, electron. That's the way every single electron transfer ch chain is working in all of life. What do you, why do we do that? We do that because if a bug is making hydrogen, it's screwed. If it makes hydrogen, the hydrogen just pops right out of the cell. You can't do a damn thing with it. You keep the hydrogen as protons and electrons, and you can manipulate the protons and electrons. All right, I'm not going to go through the whirly gig here, but I want to point out one thing. 
This is the reaction center as a few years ago. I left this structure here because it's simple to see. This is a ribbon structure. About three years ago, Shannon Okayama University published another. Uh, we, every year, we get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. Shannon is probably the best in the world at this now. He's, one of, he's been obsessed with this since he came to Japan to Renken, I, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. Um, the structure is at now about 1.9 angstrom's resolution. Very, very, very high resolution. And we know there's a business end of this structure. We know there are several parts of this structure that we can trace. So this part of the structure is coming from purple bacteria. And we know there are four manganese atoms that are sitting at the bottom end of the structure that are the business end that are splitting the water. Now, I'm not going to belabor the point, but those four manganese atoms are not found in any known mineral. Nature made a mineral. There are 31 manganese-containing minerals that I know of that Bob Downs tells me have a cubane structure of manganese, but not with a calcium, and not in that configuration, and they can't split water that I know of. Now, they're found in bacteria, so they evolved in cyanobacteria once, and then they were spread across many clades. So this is a diatom, this is a coccolithophore, and of course, they became higher plants. So this is all higher land plants, right there. And you could see that they're distributed on many, many, many eukaryotic lineages, but only one prokaryotic lineage is, is capable of splitting water extant. So this is horizontal gene transfer in a massive way. We call it endosymbiosis. It's basically another fancy term for horizontal gene transfer. Instead of taking three genes or five genes, you're taking 140 genes. And of course, on a global scale, we have great satellite images. And I've, I've spent a large portion of my career working on this. So this is what these things do today. So these are actually, obviously, satellite images in false color. But, but you could see on land and in the ocean, these guys become the major engine of life on the planet. And as Roher said, a little bit of that sinks. But now I want to get into something a little bit more profound. It doesn't just sink everywhere. I mean, it does sink everywhere, but it doesn't matter if it sinks in the middle of the deep ocean. It's not going to get into the sediments of the deep ocean. It gets oxidized before it gets there. It's shallow seas and continental margins where this organic matter originally gets deposited. And because of the Wilson cycle, which um, Everett alluded to, but didn't really describe in, in this sense. Uh, Twozo Wilson really thought this through quite interestingly. So this stable craton, which is the uh, accumulated bit of, of, of light rock, floats, and it's very thick. So its heat conduction is very weak, whereas the thin little bit of basalt out here gets Heat can go through it pretty early. So if I put a candle under here, the Archimedes principle and the candle, I can break this in principle. This is the idea. And then we start to fill in the gap by making more basalt and pushing these two bits of craton away. Now, here's the gig. At some point, when that basalt becomes cooler and heavier, it's going to subduct. So this is the Atlantic Ocean today. Now, it turns out that California is not going to bump into Japan. It's going to go back and bump into France, or at least New York will bump into France. So we'll have American fries, we'll become French fries again. That little bit of organic matter that is on continental shelves will be shaved off and uplifted onto the craton. If it just stayed in the ocean, 
we would not have appreciable amounts of oxygen. It would be subducted and burned. You have to get it out of the cycle. You lift it up onto the craton. So where does the candy get hidden? The lockbox of the candy is in rocks. So here's an example, a very dramatic example from Spain. This is my former postdoc, Bas von Schuttenbrook, and we were working on this sequence here. This is a very nice sequence, but these are black shales. Mudstones, black shales, they become repositories on land of the reducing equivalents, allowing the oxygen to be evolved. Now, for those of you who are students, I'm going to give you a little puzzler. There's 21% oxygen by mass in the atmosphere. If I converted it back to water, got rid of all the oxygen in the atmosphere, converted it back to water, how high would the sea level rise? Okay? Just, you can do that. Now, we went through this, so we go from this first half of Earth's history, we're reduced, then we have some oxidation event. So the oxidation event is not just simply because of the evolution of that four manganese cluster at the bottom of photosystem two, it's also the ability to bury and store that organic matter and take it out of the cycle. So the first half of Earth's history, we have a relatively stable condition. And somehow, and I don't know exactly how, the ball flipped into a second bowl, and it's stable again. And we're not going back. We're not going back. It's directional. So it's a two-state problem. Now, several years ago, and this is the meat of the paper, or the meat of the talk. It's an old paper, but it's still a meat of the talk. Uh, Tom Fenchel and, and Ed DeLong and I, I, I sat down with Tom for a long time in, in, in my office, and I said, you know, I really want to draw the wiring diagram of the planet. And this is the wiring, we've left out a few things. I didn't put arsenate or selenate and stuff in here. This is kind of secondary. We put in the major wiring diagrams of the planet. So this is the electron, this is the keg diagram, if you will, with just the wires, okay? So this is the metabolic map of planet Earth. And it may look a little bit like this. Actually, this is a little simpler to, to follow than the one I just showed you. But I asked my graduate student, Ben Yellen, a few years ago, to annotate that map. And if you take away all the orthologs and paralogs, all you get is 392 genes that move all the electrons off around all of Earth. Only 392 genes. That's not a lot. Now, those 392 genes are responsible for all of this type of metabolism, all of it. And you might not be surprised, but those oxidoreductases, 45% of the oxidoreductases contain transition metals. And while zinc is a transition metal, it's not found in the oxidoreductases. So the transition metals of zinc, zinc actually can be oxidized, obviously, zinc too. Um, but those electrons are not coming from the, the normal shells of the transition metals. This is acting more like calcium or magnesium. So I'm going to go into this. I'm going to fo focus on the sequences and folds for a second. The evolution of these structures is what we've been working on with Vic for years. And the paradox of structure and sequence diversion is one that I want to not dwell on. We can talk about it later. But I, I really think that this, from, uh, this is a throwaway line from, from, from Margaret Dayhoff's paper that has been cited a couple of times now from 1966. The processes of natural selection severely inhibit any change in a well-adapted system on which several other essential components depend. And that's why you don't see massive changes in Rubisco evolution, massive changes in nitrogenase evolution, massive changes in D1 evolution. Now, I think about this from a point of view when, you know, I went to a, a technical high school. I was trained in engineering. And so electrical engineering, you know, we all think about circuit diagrams. So I think about, just think about the analogy of the planet, of the surface of the planet as a circuit board. 
So you have a power supply, one major power supply, the sun. You have two wires, the ocean and the atmosphere. Those are the two wires. And then everything else on the planet that is moving electrons is basically is alive. There's some exceptions, but mostly they're alive. So these are organisms that are acting primarily as transistors, moving electrons around. All right, let's follow that analogy for a bit. What's, in, what's doping those transistors? Well, not surprisingly, of the 45% of the oxidoreductases that contain transition metals, the other 55% contain NADH or FAD or the other materials that are moving the hydrogen. Let's talk about the, the electrons. The vast majority of them contain iron as either iron or iron sulfur or heme. There's copper, manganese, nickel, a little bit of molybdenum, and then you have a little bit of cobalt and blah, blah. So the biggies are iron, copper, manganese, a little bit of nickel, a little bit of molybdenum. And of course, then we've looked at these folds. So, so this is the classic ferrodox fold. The cysteine coordinated, four cysteines coordinated with the cysteine, XX cysteine, XX cysteine, XX, and then you go on to the fourth cysteine, wrapping it around. And that fold, <coughs> you can see, is, is, is everywhere when you have iron sulfur clusters. And I just want to point out, for those of you that are not molecular or structural biologists, you can see all three secondary structures here. So this is a sheet, a loop, uh, the loop here, and a helix. Now, this is nitrogenase, and I would argue the first order, this is a super paradox type of fold. And then we have other kinds of folds, imidazole nitrogens that are coordinated to copper, plastocyanin type of fold, and the manganese fold, for example, and oxide, superoxide dismutases. And as Vic was explaining yesterday, we have tried to do a, a molecular autopsy, if you will, a structural autopsy. Uh, Haggai has been doing this with Vic and, and Doug Pike, and I think a yeoman's job and coming out with this network of the major folds of the metal-containing proteins that are moving electrons all across the tree of life. And there are these four. So symmetrin, we have the ferrodoxin fold, the cytochrome C fold, this is the heme, and then a ferrodox, I mean a plasticine and fold containing the copper. Now, I don't know the real number, but there appear to be, I think, there will be about 12 or so, maybe 15, core structural motifs in all the electron-proton transfer reactions in nature. Those are the Legos. Now, deciphering one of the things we're trying to do, I call it a grand challenge. It is a grand challenge because we're trying to figure out how these little, little tiny bits of the proteins, the extant proteins, probably moved electrons around early on to create a metabolism, not of a cell per se, but in a global sense. And here's something that's old but new, and I think about it a lot. So John Kim, who was a PhD student with us at the time, he arranged all at that time the major metal-containing proteins into this isosceles triangle of 100% sheet, 100% loop, or 100% helix. And when you do that, you can make a Euclidean vector from point to point to point and develop a tree. And before we do that, by the by, this is, if you're obviously a loop, you're sitting here, you have very, very few hydrogen bonds, you're very floppy and flexible. When you get down to a very, very, very stiff fold of a helix uh, or a, a sheet, very, very, very sheety, if you will, or very, very, very helixy, if you will, you're pretty stiff, a lot of hydrogen bonds. So if you're thinking about promiscuity of electrons moving through something, you're more promiscuous here, you're less promiscuous here. All right. And this is a secondary structural tree of these proteins. So here you can see that some of the earliest protein folds are in an iron hydrogenase. They're very close to the ferrodoxin fold. 
And we walked down and walked down and walked down. And one of the last structures to evolve, or at least in terms of complexity, in the helix clade is the cytochrome C oxidase. That's the enzyme that is allowing you to put the electrons onto oxygen to make water. And it contains copper. Now, today, there are almost all these electron transfer reactions are driven by light, not by heat. And I just want to point this out because here's where we have a stone that is really missing in my head. And we're working on this, and I don't know if I'm going to see a solution to this in my lifetime. But let's just think about this for a minute. This is the solar energy at the top of the atmosphere. And, and these lines, by the way, is that noise? Is that noise? It's not noise. What is that? Why are those lines there, huh? They're absorption, but what do we call them? Those are the Fraunhofer lines, right? So you're looking, you're looking now at elements on the corona of the sun that are absorbing in lines, right? They're not bands because they're not molecules. They're elements that are absorbing in lines. This is how we develop quantum mechanics. They're quantized. Now, at the top of the atmosphere today, whoops, there's a lot of UV light that is attenuated by ozone, but in the Archean, we didn't have ozone, we think. So this light would have reached the surface of the planet. Now, ozone, when it attenuates the light, cut that out. But up until the great oxidation event, which is how we actually define it from the mass independent to mass dependent sulfur isotope fractionation, which is apparently due to the evolution of ozone itself, this UV light would have hit the surface of the Earth. Now, I just want to point out one more thing. It is commonly thought that UV light is highly attenuated by the ocean, by seawater. It's not true. UV light is pretty penetrable as long as there are not lots of organics to absorb it. Now, this is an experiment that was done by the same John Kim who did the isosceles triangle of the structural tree, but he was... He's a pretty interesting character. We make siderite, which is iron carbonate. And iron carbonate has an antibonding orbital of about 4.8 electron volts. And that's calculable. I mean, it's, you, you don't need, you just do spectra. So if you can populate the antibonding orbital with photons, you can oxidize the iron 2 to iron 3 under anaerobic conditions. You don't need oxygen just need photons. A photon will pop an electron off of iron easily. So what does that correspond to? That corresponds to a wavelength of approximately 280 nanometers. And here you can see, I don't know if you can see it, but here you can see we, we, we just irradiated it with a, an arc lamp for a while so you could see that we could blow off the electrons right there. So follow the electrons. What did we do with the electrons, by the way? Here's, here's what happens to the iron. This is siderite. This is the product. The product is magnetite, ultimately, in the presence of oxygen. But you can see that we get, we get magnetic fields that are induced from this, from this photooxidation. And here's the absorption maximums, 270 or so. And it's a two-photon reaction. The product is H2. We can do the same thing, and this is a preliminary experiment, but with manganese carbonate. We can oxidize manganese 2 to manganese 4. And here you see an HPLC diagram we make formate, formic acid. We can also make formaldehyde. Just water, manganese carbonate, UV light, and it goes. Now, I'm going to end this, this talk 
For a while, I was the only biologist, actually, I was the only biologist that was on the scientific working group for the terrestrial planet finder, and I, I joined the, uh, uh, the interferometer group. So the interferometer group was one of the more interesting groups that I had worked on. So they wanted to put an interferometer at L2, the Lagrangian point 2, um, and NASA got scared. They, they, couldn't, they didn't want to invest in a program, apparently, where three or four satellites had to fly in formation at L2 with very, very, very little chatter between them. I mean, a small amount of wiggle and you lose the, you lose the image. But the interferometer was able to null out. This is the cool part of the interferometer. Why? You want it to look at the dark side of a planet as it comes in front of its sun, right? And you want to null out the background star. So the interferometer was capable of nulling the background star to 10 to the 6th. So you had incredibly small, small, small amounts of photons coming from the star. And by looking in the IR, you could possibly capture the infrared absorption of the gases, if there are any, on that planetary body. And they were going out to about 5.5 parsecs, roughly. The stair time would be about one month per planetary body. I'm sure we could probably do better now. But the idea was killed, ultimately, in the last decadal review. And the Darwin, an analog of this in the European Space Agency, ultimately was killed. And so we have nothing. So now what do we look at? We look at limb, limb measurements. Horrible. Horrible. The number of photons you get, it's just, it's not a good way to do it. We can do better. This is what you do when you're trying to do it, and uh, astronomers are very good at addition and subtraction, but, you know, here you have a lot of noise. So we're trying to get the glow from other planets. And, of course, what are the gases that we want to look for, and what are those suites of gases? Um, that's, of course, one of the big debates right now. I'm not going to enter that debate here in this, this lecture. So I want to conclude by, by, first of all, thinking about this. The first two and a half years of Earth's history were a research and development phase. This is when Apple was really cooking, OK? Or this was, this was the phase when a core set of metabolic machines evolved. And after that, the factory shut down. All they did was invent bodies to put the machines in. All of the key metabolic processes were evolved in, in prokaryotes. And there are only approximately 400 metabolic genes. So the, the machinery really wasn't that complicated. I don't know why we try to, you know, I don't know how many genes we've identified, but really we're spending a lot of time looking at whether the color of the bug is brown or green or red or it has chrome on the trim or it doesn't have chrome on the trim or whether it has electric windows or this is totally irrelevant for the most part. You want to get down and figure out how the pistons work, right? Or whether it's got a jet engine. The metabolic sequences are coupled on local scales, obviously, but studying this in a test tube is not the only way to do this. And so isotopes are a way to do this, but I think there are other ways to do this. And <clears throat> you can facilitate electron markets, and that's what it is in a way. And so here's really a challenge in a sense to Nigel and others, much more smart than I am. Can you invent a planet that has got a homeostatic environment for millions of years with gas compositions that don't change appreciably? With metabolic fluxes that are incredibly high, and yet the oxygen concentration is going up and down, a little bit like this. It's really hard. Bang it, you know. Bang it with a meteorite 65 million years ago? Eh, OK. We'll continue. All right. 
Now, and the contemporary electron potential is driven by light. So with that, I just want to thank many people, more than are on this picture. Most of this work was funded by the Moore Foundation. Some of the last, most recent work has been funded by NASA on the, uh, the photogeochemistry. But I especially want to thank Vic and, 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 and Ben Yellen and, and John Kim and Jana Bromberg and, and Dave Case, uh, who have helped, uh, helped us understand a little bit about, and uh, we're still learning, obviously, about how these protein nanomachines evolved and how they created a metabolic network on the planet. Um, and in so doing, potentially, how we went from the sacrificial chemistry of the photooxidation of siderite or manganese carbonate to the catalytic chemistry of photosynthesis. That, to me, is probably one of the biggest challenges that I can, I can handle. And uh, that's what I, I, I think about. So I thank you all very, very much for the opportunity to, to at least have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you for um, the now time for question. So anybody who had a comment or questions? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was very interesting. Um, I'm a planetary scientist, so I wanted to comment on something you said earlier about water delivery. It's a very big problem that still, I think, has not been solved, although much progress has been made. See, the, the, as you correctly pointed out, uh, we know that the water was not mostly cometary in origin. That is from hydrogen isotopes, that is from xenon isotopes, that is from lots of other things. So it had to be meteoritic, but even there we're running into certain problems because of what kind of meteorite you do and so forth. Recent progress, however, seems to point towards the water being delivered very early. Uh, previous theories, for example, by Francis Albarede and some others, they said that the water must have been delivered late, so after the moon formation in terms of the late veneer, late accretion and so forth, because that's how you can keep it at the surface. Turns out that that picture is probably no longer true, and that instead the water was delivered early in the first couple of million years, five to may, at most ten million years, okay. and the remaining accretion was then rather dry and reduced. Mm -hmm. And that is a new result, which I think some people in the origins of life community and the Hadean Earth and Archean Earth may want to think about because it might be able to provide you with a reduced environment rather than an oxidizing environment early on on the Earth. Okay. So who's published this? Where is this published? Uh, I have started to publish this. There's one or two other collaborators. Okay. It, this is slowly coming out. Okay. Uh, but it's relatively new. I just wanted to point that out and for some people So do we here. have zircons or something that can help us inform this or is models? Uh, it's both. Okay. It's a combination of both. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to seeing it. Just on a, on a note here, over here. Okay. Right. On a big perspective note, so you, you, I completely agree that eukaryotes are absolutely boring in terms of metabolism and biochemistry, but they are not in terms of complexity, uh, of course. Okay. And, um, and so I wanted to know your perspective, just in general, um, be, it being a keynote speaker and, and everything, on how you would see complexity arising, because it only did one. So there's only one type of complex thing on Earth, uh, which then led on to plants and animals and fungi and so on. Do you see that happening more than once on Earth and maybe elsewhere in the universe, if there's life? Let's assume, let's assume there is life. Would, mm -hmm. would there be complex life somewhere else? And so let's ask the, ask the question, which is seldom asked, actually. Why are there animals? Why multicellular? What's so great about multicellularity? Everything I think about in multicellularity you have a lower reproductive rate. You have a higher energy intensity. It's, it's, there's no great advantage until you start to think about it in terms of a physics problem. So here's the way I think about it in a physics problem. If I take a single-celled organism that is trying to, for example, use a flagella to 
get some bacteria into its orifice, its mouth. It's working at a very, very, very low Reynolds number. So the viscosity that this guy is experiencing is very, very high. So these would be, for example, a single-cell coanoflagellate. This is the, one of the earliest organisms that we can think of that forms, or we know that today, forms colonies. And why am I thinking about this? For many years, we know that the first fossils of organisms were like sponges in the Cambrian. Now, there were sponges in the Ediacaran, and there are other organisms in the Ediacaran, which nobody knows what the hell they really did. But let's think about sponges for a minute. So sponges were dissected in the, by, the, by many people, but a French guy in the 1880s or so noticed that the linings of the inside of a sponge had flagella that looked like coanoflagellates, and he called those cells coanocytes. Now, why am I saying that? Because you can take a sponge and put it through a sieve, and the cells will self-assemble which is amazing, and they will form, these coanocytes will form a colony again, right up through a tube. Now, let's think about this for a minute. The coanocytes are all beating their flagella in the same direction. So instead of having a single cell now forage a few millimeters at a time for bacteria, now you can filter from a stationary organism hundreds of liters of seawater in a day. So the foraging area is huge without having to move. So it's a fluid dynamics problem to me that originated complexity. It's an interesting one. I'm not sure I'm right, but it's at least something to think about when you start to get to organisms that became marine organisms that are living in this world of a high viscous property at very small size, becoming much less inhibited by the Reynolds number issue when they become larger and larger, and then the selection pressure to go from a spherical blob to a bilaterian, which is able to cut through water much more efficiently, leads to body forms. So I've had this conversation with several paleontologists, Doug Irwin, others, but th this issue of why animals is really kind of sidestepped. It's not just complexity, but what is the advantage of multicellularity? Okay, what are the advantages of multicellularity? So I, I, complexity, complexity is a subjective term. Multicellularity is an objective term. And I, I would rather, I, I think an E. coli is complex. Okay, so I, I just think that we, we should be a little careful about what the selection pressures were to allow this. Now if you think about this, this foraging issue becomes really interesting if you can outcompete other organisms, right? Then you can become more efficient, even in multicellularity, if you grow slowly, but you still capture more food. So it, it is, uh, to me, it's some place to explore. I, I don't have the answers, but I'm, I just think about it a lot. Okay. Hi, thanks for, uh, yeah, the incredible, incredible talk. Actually, my, my question is, is, is sort of quite closely related to the previous one. So uh, you've alluded to the fact that the bulk of um, the electron transport and the bulk of uh, metabolic biochemical activity on Earth can be, um, uh, can be narrowed down to this very small number of genes, very small number of um, uh, nanoscale machines. So if that's true... Uh, why is it that um, that implies that life is carrying around a lot of redundant excess baggage? Mm -hmm. And the question is, why does it not dump? My question is, why does it not ditch all that excess baggage? Um, and, well, there uh, are lots. Of, okay. Yeah. I, I was talking here about the electron transfer part of it. So mm -hmm. you have uh, other genes that are responsible for replication, other genes are responsible for making the membranes and so on. So, I mean, when you get down to it, as we know, we need about thousand genes or something to make a bug, right? I don't know what the minimal number is. I mean, Craig Venter probably can make a bug with 400 genes or 500 genes for one bug. But uh, if you start to make, uh, say, 40 different bugs that carry out all the basic metabolic processes on the planet, a few tens of thousands of genes. 
Yeah, so I guess, well, uh, sort of... Not um, millions. Yeah. An alternative form of my question is, why, um, if metabolism is so simple, is relatively simple on the bulk level, why did the Earth not just choose to, to just do those... That do that bioenergetics in bulk, uh, uh, instead, and why did it choose to it probably, all this? It probably yeah. was much simpler a long time ago. You know, mm. eukaryotes screwed this thing up. We have a lot of, so you only have 20,000, 22,000 genes, protein coding genes, right? So, uh, if I take a dinoflagellate. Let, let's take the dinoflagellates have, as far as I know, the largest genomes of a single celled organism on the planet. The smallest dinoflagellate genome is in Symbiodinium microadriaticum, which is the zooxanthella that lives inside a coral. That genome is about 1.9 gigabases. It also has 20,000 protein coding genes. If I take another dinoflagellate that's free living, I can get up to 12 gigabases. It has 20,000 genes that are protein coding. So most of these genes are simply dispersed in, within introns and transposons. Um, and it's, it's, that, to me, is the selfish genome problem, right? So this, is, this goes back to Carmen Sapienza and, 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 and uh, Ford Doolittle. I mean, it, it is a problem of why these pieces of DNA are not shucked. Uh, and you don't see this in eukaryote, uh, prokaryotes so much, but it certainly is a very interesting problem of, you know, the minimalist. Why aren't we all minimalists, right? I don't know the answer. Okay. Last two questions first. Um, Paul, I've got a, a kind of two related questions. The first question is, is in your siderite experiments, is the siderite acting as a catalyst and to split water and in, 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 in doing so is being oxidized by the... the uh, oxygen radical that's being produced. Yes. So that's the first question. But then the second follow-up, uh, regardless of that, it's, it's a really interesting process that you observe because, and I think it's incredibly relevant to the origin of life, or at least early life, because of some of the recent results people are showing for methanogens, acetogens, and sulfur reducers, whatever, in that they can reduce iron with hydrogen. Right. Many of them can. They can, you know, so methanogens don't necessarily need to reduce CO2 for right. their energy metabolism, as it appears. You're absolutely right, Eric. So in, in the real world, that would have been a cycle. So you would have oxidized the iron, the siderite. You would have reduced it by either a bug or, or just an environmental uh, reducing agent. And you could have kept this going and going and going and going again continuously. Uh, and it has occurred to us that this is probably what happened early on. Now, uh, 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 just a brain fart, just to think about that. When I, we published this paper, I sent it to Grotzinger. I said, that's why there's no carbonates left on Mars, on the surface of Mars, because you probably had a thin, wet veneer at some point. You had UV sunlight bombarding the surface. That regolith became oxidized. And what happens to the carbon? <laughs> becomes CO2. Um, and so it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting problem planetarily. I, d I don't know if, if that's the real case uh, on Mars, but um, it's certainly one of these things that could have happened. It never happened on the moon, by the way. It didn't happen on the moon. You need liquid water. Um, so at least we seem to need liquid water. But we don't split, we don't split water. I wish. If we were splitting water, I wouldn't be here talking to you. I'd be cutting a writing the ends of uh, a check for a few million dollars of a patent, and, and, and uh, I would be living in Hawaii or something. Um, I wish. Um, you know, Nate Lewis and Chuck Dismukes and Gary Brudvig, a lot of people on this planet are trying to split water with earth-abundant transition metals as catalysts. So Dan Nocera has been using uh, cobalt uh, in, at, at Rutgers. Uh, Chuck Dismukes uses iron. There are other people that are trying to use manganese. Um, we're, just, we're just taking protons and, and sticking electrons onto the protons to make hydrogen in that case. What was the second question? So in, in the process, then you're oxidizing the, the iron in the siderite. Okay. Right. Uh, and, well, it's more of a comment. It just has incredible relevance to what right. was possible on early Earth when we think that life was oxidant limited, maybe limited to CO2. It need not be if you had UV, you had siderite. Yeah, yeah, had, yeah, yeah. 
right? You yeah. can generate the oxidant in that form right, and right, support some of these early right. evolving exactly. metabolism. That's exactly yeah. how it works. So, I mean, I know Mike has thought about, I mean, Karen Smith popularized this, I guess, and when he was in Glasgow, uh, what, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? So Graham Karen Smith uh, started to experiment on, uh, on minerals and photooxidation of minerals. It's one of these things that it's, it's sort of a, a limb out here in geochemistry. This isn't biogeochemistry, it's pure geochemistry. Uh, where very, very, very few people work in this area, very few. And usually there's one person that does this for 10 or 15 years. Martin Schoonen was the last at Stony Brook. And then, you know, he kind of retired from science. He's now a, a co-director at Brookhaven National Lab. And people go, yeah, okay, that was interesting. And they forget about it, and it's rediscovered 10 years later, and that's the way it goes. So we haven't really had a concerted effort in understanding how photons can transform minerals and ultimately move on to become catalysts. And I think it's time. So I tried that, but, you know, uh, it's, it's one of these things where we'll have to do it without funding because it was last time out when we tried this with an NAI proposal, the, it came back, it was too risky. Okay, I don't know why, but that's what, that was the proposal. We got, we used the rejection to get the money from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. It's the first time I've used a rejection letter. We used a rejection letter to get something funded. Um, but it is an interesting problem because if you think about it, we know a lot, a lot in terms of calculating anti-bonding orbitals. We know a lot about um, basics of quantum mechanics. We should be able to screen a whole series of Earth abundant minerals in the Archean period and say, how did these come to be appropriated to make electrons move catalytically, right? So I, could I stick a 12 amino acid peptide onto a piece of siderite and make a catalyst? I don't know. If I could, you know, that would be very cool. Well, I'm sorry, I was completely with you until the questions, and that's what made me ask a question. Okay. It's sort of your dismissal of the um, why we have animals. And I love your perspective of the Reynolds numbers, uh -huh. but they're all the sort of traditional things that you can have specialization of cells, you can avoid predation, you can, yeah. you know, you can do all sorts of things when you're multicellular. Um, and so I was curious why you, you sort of ignored that. And the other thing would be why do you become bilaterally symmetrical so that you don't have your anus and your mouth in the same orifice? Well, the bilateral symmetrical issue for me is a hydrodynamic issue. Right, start. that's why I was, I was curious. Right. So I, yeah. I think about it, you know, I'm trained in biophysics, I think about it in physics. Right, but from a metabolic uh, point of view, it makes a heck of a lot more sense to have one end at one end. And yeah, one yeah, end yeah, so the protostome deuterostome yeah. issue, I mean, I'm not going to go down that road. That's a developmental problem. But I think that the issue here of the fundamental question is scaling metabolism to sharing resources between cells so that you have shared responsibilities to make an organism, right? right. So that ultimately uh, is, a, is a, a fundamental problem in developmental biology, but it is also not exactly clear to me why you had to do this. There's, there's no, we were perfectly fine for 2.8, you know, it's only, what, we have animals, the oldest animal that we have on the planet, I think in the fossil yeah. record, is 635 million years old. Mm -hmm. So for, you know, 85, 90% of Earth's history, I don't know the number, I just, I, around 80% of Earth's history or more, microbes had the world unto themselves. They were perfectly fine. And they still are there. They're still the dominant creatures. They're still making the planet go around. I mean, animals and plants are kind of like, you know, they're kind of decorations. They're but as a fellow pro protistan, you do know that virtually every protistan taxon has multicellular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so I mean, you know, it's yeah, done yeah, over yeah, and over. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah, yeah, all I want to say. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks so, so thanks again, Paul.